Hello and welcome to Wealthion. I'm your host, Andrew Brill. Tax day is right around the corner and it's a day many of us dread. But what if I told you taxes can be fun, easy, and understandable? Would it still be a day you want to erase from your calendar? We'll discuss that and more right now. Our mission here at Wealthion is to help all of us keep and grow our money, but Wealthion's not just a channel, it's a conversation with our community. So please keep the feedback coming. If there's something you'd like us to talk about or someone you'd like to hear from, let us know. And if you could like and subscribe the channel, we'd really appreciate it. So I'd like to welcome in Tom Wheelwright. He is a CPA, he's the CEO of Wealth Ability. He's also a best selling author of Tax Free Wealth. And Tom believes that taxes can be fun, easy, and understandable. And Tom, after reading your book, I'm almost converted to being a, <laughs> a, a tax okay guy, but explain to us how taxes can be fun, easy, and understandable. Well, first of all, um, Andrew, they're, they're just not that complex in, in concept. So the concepts are pretty simple. Um, remember, it's your money. That's rule number one. It's not the government's money. It's your money. And, and that really the second one is that all you have to do is change some of your facts in order to reduce your taxes. And, and uh, we can get into that a little bit more, but I think they're fun. If you look at the word refund, just write it down right in the middle is the word fun. Everybody likes getting a good refund. So to me, um, taxes are a game. We're all in this game. We don't get to choose whether we're in this game. Um, that's a fallacy that you can choose to get out of the game. And so I'm just thinking if I'm in a game, I'd, I'd rather win the game. I mean, yeah, taxes, I guess, can be fun and, and you make them fun. And obviously, you know how to deal with those. How do we get out of the mindset? And, and I find myself saying it, look, I don't mind paying my fair share. Everybody's in that mindset of, OK, you know what? I'm going to have to pay the government something. That's a mindset. And we need to get out of that, according to your book, which I've read and, and was fascinated by. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really that. This idea that we have to pay taxes. I mean, yes, we're obligated to follow the tax law, but the idea that the tax law is all there just to raise revenue is a, is a fallacy. Um, most of the tax law is really there to encourage certain behaviors. For example, um, why do people invest in a 401k? Typically because they get a tax deduction. Why do they buy a house instead of rent? typically because they get a tax deduction, right? So there are a lot of incentives. And in fact, if you look at the tax law, like I have for 45 years, um, you'll see that the first 30 pages really raise revenue. They give you, here's how much tax to pay. They say, everything's taxable unless we say it isn't. And they say, nothing's deductible unless we say it is. And then they give you charts and tables. But the rest of the tax law is fundamentally a roadmap for reducing your taxes. It's an instruction guide to what are those things that the government wants you to do, that if you do those things, you'll reduce your taxes. You said we have to change the facts. And explain this to me a little bit more, because I'd love to change my facts and pay a little bit less. But what are the facts that we're looking to change? Well, let me give you an example. So any expense can either be deductible or not. Okay, so so if you ask me, for example, is um, that microphone that you're look, you're speaking into, is that deductible? I'm going, well, if that were used in your personal studio for fun and entertainment, it would be, no, it's not deductible. But if you use that in your business to create a podcast, to create revenue, it becomes deductible. So you've just changed the facts. You haven't changed that you have a microphone in a studio. What you've changed is, is how you use that microphone and what you use it for. So the, the key is you have to decide, first of all, you have to have a choice. You have to know what facts can you change. And then you have to decide, do I want to change those facts? Uh, uh, let me give you a simple example. So I love, uh, my wife and I love going to Hawaii, all right? And uh, a lot of people like to travel. Okay, we could go to Hawaii, and if we did certain activities while we were there, that travel would be deductible. Now, I choose for the travel sometimes to not be deductible because I don't want to spend four and a half hours a day uh, doing business with people in Hawaii, right? I, I actually want to take a vacation. And so, but that's a fact, and I've had clients that 
actually have changed what their behavior was on their travel just so the travel could be deductible. So you could actually plan for that. And in your book, you say you need to plan for your taxes or plan your life around plan certain things around whether things are going to be taxable or not. This is a perfect example. Yeah, it, exactly. You know, the, the goal of tax free wealth is really to give you that choice. You know, here's things that you could do to change your facts. Here's the things you can do. I, I always tell my clients, I say, I can't change your tax. I can tell you what facts you need to change in order to change your tax, but you actually have to change the facts. So you're the one who actually has to do the work while you're tra while you travel. You're the one who has to, um, uh, you know, change how you use your automobile, change how you use your house, create your own business, uh, you know, start that, that new business on the side so that you can have a home office deduction. So you can do that. I can't do that for you, but what I can do is I can tell you all those things you can do to seriously reduce or eliminate your taxes. So it's the, the tax law is actually written, as you say, to save you money. In, yeah, in it, if you look at things in that perspective. No, no question. Um, this was really started back in the John F. Kennedy days. Um, there was a little bit of this done before then, but uh, in John F. Kennedy took a look at what was going on in the economy and he felt like we needed to incentivize manufacturing. And so he went out and created this um, investment tax credit. It was a 10% credit uh, for buying new equipment, manufacturing equipment. And, you know, really it was a test is, will this stimulate investment in manufacturing equipment? And it worked. And then Reagan came along and he looked at, we need to stimulate investment in housing. And lo and behold, that worked. Now, uh, recently, President Biden has said we need to to encourage investment in renewable energy. And so there's huge renewable energy tax incentives. So it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, but all politicians, first of all, the power to tax is probably the greatest power that they have. And so no, no politicians ever voluntarily given up power um, while they're a politician. And so this idea of what well, we can actually kind of incentivize people to do certain things like build a business, like um, uh, create, I mean, we saw it during COVID, right? We saw the, the incentives the government gave to the drug manufacturers to come up with the vaccine, Operation Warp Speed, right? Warp Speed, right? Well, those were direct incentives, but uh, most incentives actually that the government um, hands out are in the form of tax incentives. So a lot of our viewers are going to say, oh, well, you know, I don't want to start a business, um, middle class. Are, are there also ways to train yourself or plan for people who don't want to own a business or who don't want to invest in manufacturing and that sort of thing as, as you know, President Kennedy did back then? Are there ways for people to live and minimize their tax burden as well? There, there are, but remember that um, investing in derivatives like the stock market uh, give you much fewer tax benefits than investing directly in what we would call hard assets like a business, like um, energy, like um, agriculture, uh, like housing. Okay. But it doesn't have to be a traditional business. So it doesn't have to be something that, you know, you do from a desk, et cetera. I mean, it could be, for example, you could buy investment real estate that is still a business under the law. You could invest in energy, clean energy or renewable uh, or, or fossil fuel energy. Both of those have big tax benefits, but you have to invest directly. You can't, it's investing in the, in the company that does the investment, the company gets the tax benefit, not you. Whoever does the direct investing gets the tax benefit. So, but someone could set themselves up as a business I guess with an LLC and not get paid on a W-2 if their employer is willing, get paid on a 1099, and that could have some tax benefits as well. For sure. If you're an independent contractor, now you have to be a true independent contractor because the states especially, are, and, and as well as the Department of Labor, are pretty careful about this. But you, you can set yourself as an independent contractor. It actually does a couple of things for you. One is it gives you freedom uh, if you want more freedom in your employment and your job, be an independent contractor because then you can do work for somebody else as well. You don't have to just do it for one employer. I mean, that's the, one of the advantages I see to owning a business. You don't have a single customer. 
uh, you have multiple customers. And I think that there's a lot less risk to having multiple customers. But what happens is your, your wages are all subject to social security taxes and you don't get any deductions as an employee. I mean, none, they took that all the way in 2017. So what happens is, is that for example, during COVID, we all worked from home. A lot of us still work from home. Um, we all worked from home. Those who were working from home in their own business, even as an independent contractor, got to deduct things like their home office, like uh, their travel, like their cars, like their computers, that kind of stuff. But those who were employees in a home office did not get those deductions. So the fact of being a business owner, or an independent contractor, uh, creates a lot of lot of tax benefits. So if I was able to, if my employer said, okay, you know, I'll pay you on a 1099, but the health benefits and all like all that stuff went away, I now have to go out and buy my own health benefits. But could that also be a tax deduction? Yeah, for sure. So, so you might, you know, the employer, of course, you'd negotiate with employer. Well, you need to increase my, what you're paying me so that I can go do that. Um, but that is deductible as a self-employed person you do get to deduct your health insurance that's a direct deduction so you don't lose that tax benefit of deducting your health insurance um you can even set things up so that you deduct medical expenses when you have your own business which is harder to do when you're an employee um but um yeah that you know there's all sorts of tax benefits. for example um you don't have to pay social security tax on 100% of the income that you receive into the business if you set up as an S corporation. So S corporation income is not earned income. It's uh, ordinary, but not earned. So it's not subject to social security taxes. Only the wages you pay yourself from that S corporation are subject to social security taxes. So you can even reduce your social security taxes. Oddly enough, even though you're only paying half of them as an employee, you can actually reduce them by being self-employed. And then you could take deductions off the business or use the right. business to pay for meals, to pay for travel, if it's travel related, if it's, all that stuff. If it's business related, right. There are basically four rules for a deduction. First, it has to have a business purpose. And then you have to, it has to be ordinary, meaning it's typical in your business. And the third one I think is next to the most important, which it has to be necessary, meaning that the purpose of the expense is to create income. That's the purpose of the expense. And then the fourth one, of course, is you have to document it. I, I like to say, if you pretend to document it, you get a pretend deduction. <laughs> that, that's a good one. Are there common deductions that the ordinary person doesn't take, someone who's not set up as a business or someone who's doing their own taxes, so to speak, and says, you know what, I, I have to figure out how to lower my tax burden. Are there certain tax deductions that people don't, that you typically see people don't take? Yeah, I, I'd say the big one is a home office. Um, and, and that unfortunately is probably because their tax preparer told them not to take the home office deduction, which is just silly um, because it's there, it's available, it's in the law. Why wouldn't you take a deduction that you're absolutely entitled to? And the home office deduction, not only do you get a portion of your, um, of your, of your, mortgage, which you would otherwise write even if you if you didn't have a home office as long as you itemize. But in addition, you get um, to take a portion of your maintenance, you get a, a portion of your cleaning, a, a portion of your utilities, a portion of your internet. So you get a portion of all that. But there's something bigger than that um, with a home office. You actually probably increase the amount of your automobile deduction. And the reason is because the IRS says that the first trip you take from your home to your office is a commute and that's not deductible if your commute is from your kitchen to your home office that's the commute and then from there everything is deductible so most people i find will increase their automobile deduction by at least 50 percent um, by having a home office so if there's someone on a w-2 that's working two or three days in an office and a couple days at home they can deduct part of their home as a home office. As long as they're an independent contractor and they're not, and they're not an employee. That is correct. If you're an employee, you don't get that deduction. Gotcha. So you, you had mentioned 401ks and uh, uh, putting money in an R IRA. What about a Roth IRA? That's a different story. And I know that th that goes in post tax and then grows tax free. 
Yeah. So, so it's really interesting. In, in, um, I, I wrote a second book called the win-win wealth strategy and I actually did the, I did the numbers. I ran the numbers on, uh, Roth versus regular, um, 401k. And, uh, you know, it, Really, it depends on does a regular 401k, the tax deduction, does it allow you to put more in? And if it allows you to put more in because you don't have to pay the taxes on it, then a regular IRA or 401k probably makes sense for a lot of people um, as long as they're investing in those things that make sense in a 401k, like the stock market, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, etc. cetera. Um, if you're investing in real estate, don't be doing it in a 401k. That's a bad idea um, because you're just taking a non-taxable investment, real estate, and making it taxable by putting it into a 401k. Um, as far as a Roth goes, you know, Roth, uh, uh, as most people, I think, understand that the income from a Roth is not taxable. Um, uh, now, they have the same restrictions when it comes to uh, using debt. Um, they have the same, uh, you know, Roth versus a regular, um, they, they have the same restrictions on what you can invest in and how you invest. But as far as, um, the tax liability, uh, certainly if you are going to max it out either way, then maxing out a Roth probably makes more sense than maxing out a regular 401k. So you, you talked about using some stuff for real estate and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Do you tax wise, do you look at good debt versus bad debt? Obviously, you know, credit card debt is just the devil and mm -hmm. maybe a, a mortgage because of the deduction you get is is better debt. Is there good debt versus bad debt when it comes to taxes? Well, I think there's good debt versus bad debt, period. Um, good debt is uh, is debt that buys an asset that produces that puts money in your pocket, period. Um, bad debt is anything that takes money out of your pocket. So I think a home mortgage is actually bad debt because it does take money out of your pocket. Even though you get a tax deduction, it just takes less money out of your pocket, but it still takes money out of your pocket. So don't think of it as good debt. Good debt is something that, that produces income. And uh, really the idea on debt, when you think about, okay, when does debt make sense? If you have an asset that produces income, you probably want more of that asset. You know, whether that's somebody on your uh, advisory team, whether it's um, whether it's equipment, no matter what it is, you want more of it. Right. Because it's going to produce more income. So what you typically do is you borrow in, in order to buy more of the asset. Let's take, for example, let's say you're investing in real estate. OK, you could let's say you have one hundred thousand dollars to invest. Well, you can invest one hundred thousand into one hundred thousand dollars of real estate, pay cash for it. Um, like some people recommend constantly, um, or you could go borrow $400,000 from the bank and buy $500,000 of real estate. Well, if it's producing income and it produces more income than the, the uh, if, uh, if the income rate of return um, is higher than the interest you're paying out, then you absolutely want to borrow. If it pays less, than the income you're getting in, then that would be bad debt because taking money out of your pocket. From a tax standpoint though, investment interest is deductible, whereas personal interest is not. So um, personal interest from a tax standpoint is always bad. <laughs> and from an investment or business standpoint, um, at least the government is sharing in the cost of borrowing. So let me get this straight. If I bought a rental unit and I'm paying, I, I mortgage, put a, more, a little bit of a mortgage on that, but my expenses are less than, <clears throat> my expenses are less than what I'm taking in. Is the interest on that mortgage tax deductible? Because it, it, it is, and it doesn't have a limit. So un unlike your home mortgage interest, remember we've got the seven or $50,000 limit, right? Same with property taxes, right? We have this $10,000 limit on tax deduction. You don't have those limits when you're talking about rental properties, as an example, or business, you don't have those same limits. Wow. So what do you suggest people do with their mortgages? Obviously people are, you know, you go and buy a house, you don't have all that cash to plop down. You try and pay that off sooner rather than later. That's one of those debts I would assume you try and pay off. You, you know, I, I think, um, I think houses are very personal. I think you decide, you know, I, from a pure investment analysis, what you do is look at what's the interest rate that I'm paying on that mortgage versus what could I earn in the market? And if I can earn more in the market uh, safely, then I should 
be putting a mortgage on the house because that makes it good debt because then I'm taking that money that I would otherwise put down on the house and I'm putting into investment that makes more money than the interest cost me. So it's the same analysis as with a rental property. So let's talk about, since we're on property, let's talk about real estate taxes. And um, I, I know that every time I get my tax bill for my real estate taxes, I kind of beat my head against the wall. And then I read your book and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go and challenge my taxes. People don't understand go. that they can do that sort of thing. So you talk to us about how to lower your nut when it comes to real estate taxes. Yeah, it's really interesting. Property taxes, uh, that, that's your county assessor that assesses the real estate taxes. And uh, you, you really ought to check how you're taxed versus your neighbors because you can use them. If you have a neighbor that's got a similar property to yours and they're being taxed less, you can go on the county assessor. They will reduce your taxes. Um, you can challenge the value of the home, right? You can say, well, look, my home's not nearly worth this. And this is a really good time, you know, like today, this is a good time to challenge that value because home prices have skyrocketed over the last couple of years and county assessors tend to lag in changing the valuation on your property tax bill. So you may find that your home has gone down in value, but the property, the county assessor has not reflected that in your tax bill. So absolutely don't just put that, don't just file that property tax notice away. Uh, make sure you take a look at it and say, okay, I'd like to go in because you can look at everybody else's taxes as well. It's public knowledge on, on the county assessor website. Just go and look. Is, uh, am I paying more tax than somebody else? If I am, maybe I can reduce my property tax bill. But they have a they have a, a tricky way of dealing with your taxes. They don't look at like if I own a house that's worth six hundred thousand dollars, they give it a value, and then they 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 tack on a per, they they look at a percentage of that value. So if right. they see that the value is coming down, they up their percentage. So they, they think that they're winning, or you feel like they're winning, no matter what. Yeah, they can, but but in most states have most uh, states have limitations on how much they can raise that percentage. So, for example, in Arizona, we have two different values: full cash value and limited cash value. And the limited cash value, they they can raise the full cash value, but they can't raise the limited cash value. So, it it does get a little complex. There are property tax consultants that um, you can go to, and they will just do it on a um, percentage of what they save you. And so it really doesn't cost you anything. And not only that, but they'll save it and they'll charge you the first year. But you know, if you're reducing your value, that probably gets reduced for a very long time, not just one year. So, you know, you're talking about people who deal with property taxes. What if, you know, here I am, Andrew Brill, and I need to go find a tax accountant or an accountant that knows taxes. Tom, what am I looking for? Because I'm going to go out and find an accountant. I'm going to say, okay, you know, can you do my taxes? But that's not the right way to do it. You need somebody who actually, like you, who's been studying the tax law for so long. You want to make sure they know the tax law. How do you, how do you figure that out? Well, you know, first, first of all, um, I think the most important thing is what questions they ask you. Are they asking you real questions? Uh, for example, you know, by reading my book that if you're going to change your tax, you have to change your facts. So they should be asking you a lot about what your facts are and what your perspective facts are. So one of the things I always like, I like to see a tax advisor who will ask, how do you make your money now? And what are you planning to do with your money when you make more? Um, because how you invest your money has a bigger impact on your taxes than how even how you make your money. And, uh, and, and so it's really the quality of the questions uh, to me. One other thing I would add here, Andrew, is that um, if you find, if you run into a tax advisor who sounds, you know, like they want you to think they know it all, I would run away because no tax advisor <laughs> knows everything. I learned early on in my, when I was getting my master's degree at the University of Texas, um, I had a professor who said, the thing about tax law is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So you want, you want a tax advisor who's always learning that isn't you know, relying on old information. I mean, to hear people say that, for example, a home office is a red flag, this is somebody who has not learned something new in 30 years, um, because it used to be. It used to be a red flag. It's not anymore if you do it right. So things change. So you want a tax advisor who really is staying up on the law and really is asking the questions. 
So, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. And I think that, that that those are great questions that to ask and make sure that you're getting to the right place. But what happens if you get to that person who, or, or even not, if, if the government says, okay, you know what, tag, you're it, you get audited. And I think a, a lot of people, when they do their tax, they're like, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm afraid of an audit. I don't want to get audited. You know, I, I think that's on some a lot of people's minds when they go to do their taxes. Like, I, I'll pay it. Just leave me alone. <laughs> All right. So I, I have a um, I have an exercise for us. OK, you ready for this? Yes. OK, repeat after me. I will never. I will never. Speak to. Speak to. The IRS. The IRS. That is the best way for you to never have to worry about not. It's not your job. It's my job. And if you have, a, I would tell you, if you find a tax advisor or tax preparer who's afraid of an IRS audit, you need a new tax preparer or tax advisor because we're the professionals. We have, you know, a good tax advisor has way more experience than an IRS audit, way, way more knowledge than an IRS auditor. So, it, it, you know, be like going to LeBron James and saying, hey, you know, let, uh, could you take on you know, this co college student who wants to play me one-on-one, -on -one. could you be my sub? And that's what you want to do. You want, you want the LeBron James of tax advisors and you want them coming in and working on your behalf. You don't actually have an obligation to ever talk to the IRS. You can give somebody else that authority. You can give me that authority. You can give my advisors that authority um, uh, that, that work on, in, uh, in our, our wealth ability advisors. So you can, you don't have to do that. And that's how I think you stop being afraid of an IRS audit. Have a good tax advisor that has your back. Now, that that's I, I get that, and and you know, how do you find that? I, I you know, you explain to me how you find that person is with the with the questions they ask, and it's do you have to keep? You know, what happens if you get audited? Is it you know? Do you have to keep documentation? Do you make sure that everything is on the up and up? And, you know, I, I, there's ways to explain everything. And it's like you said, it's your facts. But let's say you get audited. What's coming at you? Well, so so the first thing um, that they're looking for is, do you have documentation for those deductions, those credits that you took? Um, uh, that's why I said earlier, pretend documentation gives you a pretend deduction. The IRS will never get to whether you're entitled that deduction if they can't, if you can't give them the documentation because you don't have the documentation, you're not entitled to the deduction. Uh, one thing to remember is that you have to prove that it's deductible. It's not deductible and then they have to prove it isn't. Remember, the rule is nothing's deductible unless the, unless the, the law says it is. So you have to prove that exception to the law that says your expense is deductible. And that's why that documentation is so important. I, th this actually goes back to your tax advisor, your tax preparer, who and your tax advisor, by the way, should be the same person. Um, or at least the same firm, because I find these days that a lot of tax preparers do not retain the documentation that their clients give them. They don't maintain the work papers. I think that's a, I think that is a huge mistake. I think it's a mistake to have a tax preparer who doesn't maintain that documentation. There are very large firms. Um, you would be shocked because you would know them that they do not retain documentation for their clients. So you have to retain it because it is not assured that your tax preparer is retaining that. Now we do, you know, our, our advisors all retain the documentation. Um, but that's frankly, I'm finding it, le it less and less common among tax preparers to retain their a copy of their client's documentation. So you do have to maintain that. Other than that, really, um, once you handle, you, and you want to be careful about what you give the um what you give the irs so i find that this is why i don't want you to talk to the irs because you'll give them too much you'll cause cause them to have questions um i actually had a, an, a situation where i had a friend who was being audited and they'd given everything to their cpa and the cpa hadn't even looked at it they just turned it over to the irs and the irs a auditor can, come goes goes to her supervisor and says i don't even know what to do with all this and the supervisor says, you're right, you're not experienced enough. We're going to give this to a much more experienced auditor. So the CPA actually caused more audit problems because they turned over too much information. Um, we're only required to turn over information to the 
IRS request. So we don't ever turn over information the IRS isn't asking for. And then even how you turn over that information can be important. So this is why I think having that, you know, really good tax advisor in your uh, camp can make, it, it can make or break you. Yeah, I know my tax advisor keeps everything digitally. I have all the hard copies. I keep them in a file for seven years and, you know, there you I'm, go. I'm good to go. So let, let's get into life planning a little bit. You know, you, you have people that are getting married or there's another life event. They're having a baby. How do you plan? I, I know you you have to plan and it's about your facts. How do you plan for all of that? Well, so, so true story. So my wife and I have been married nine years now. Um, and, uh, she was hesitant to get married because she knew her taxes would go up and she was right. Her taxes, uh, mine didn't, uh, mine were already high enough in the first place. Um, but her taxes went up and, uh, because there is a marriage penalty, it's a true penalty. Um, you can pay as much as 30 to, uh, $35,000 more being married than being single. So if, taxes are a motivator for you and you don't care, care whether you have a ring or not um, or have a, a marriage certificate, then you may want to think twice about that. It's a bizarre, it's absolutely a bizarre disincentive to getting married. Um, so that is a consequence. Um, having children has less of a consequence than it used to. We used to have, um, we used to have personal exemptions for our kids. We don't have those right now because we have this this large standard deduction instead. So um, uh, it's it's a little odd that having children, we think of them now, some states still do. I know that uh, Georgia, for example, held that a fetus gets a tax exemption because they're, they're under their law, a fetus is a person. So they get a tax exemption um, while the mother is pregnant with the, with, with the baby, even before the baby's born. And so states also have tax laws. Remember that St your state tax law can be big. If you're in California it's, or New York, it's very big. Even in other states, it's, you know, the average tax rates are, for a state is about 5%. And that's a, you know, if that's 5% of your total income, that can actually be a pretty serious number. So don't forget the state taxes. So that little kid now grew up and is on its way to college. What is there something that, look, I'm going to pay all this money to college. Please, Toms, tell me something there was we can deduct because we have a little one going to college. You, you know, there's there's actually a lot of things you can do and and uh, um, a lot of good options. You know, if, if you're going to, if you want to, um, and if you've got a business um, and they can work in your business, you can actually pay them to work in your business. They're gonna pay at their own tax rates, which could be, they get their own standard deduction if you pay them, um, which is, is you know for, like $14,000 now. And uh, they don't pay income tax on that. Now you could still take that money and put it into a Roth IRA for them, right? Or a Roth 401k for them. Well, if you do that, that grows tax free. And remember that you can take, um, after five years, you can take the amount of money you put in to the Roth 401k, you can take it out uh, with no penalties. So you could actually use the, the principal portion of what you put in, what the child put in for their uh, education over the last 10 years, for example, and that's not taxable when they take it out. So they could actually use their Roth for their education. You know, uh, another thing they could do is they, you know, instead you could pay them and they could invest in real estate. They could, they could have their own business. I mean, there are a lot of kids I mean, you pull up TikTok for about 50 seconds and you'll find 50 different kids um, that have businesses and they're doing very well. And uh, and so, you know, helping your kids understand finance and actually um, working with them on investing themselves rather than you investing, I think is a, a huge tax benefit. I mean, there's always, you know, I mean, if you, if you, if you don't want to think about it and you know, you're not really interested in investing and you just want to put the money away, then you can consider a 529 plan with 529 plan. Um, I'm not a huge fan cause you don't have a lot of control over it. Fortunately, you can, you can roll it over, um, to an IRA, um, which is nice, um, up to a certain amount. Um, but it, it's pretty limited. Remember it's a state, it's the state, uh, requires certain types of investment parameters um, around it. So uh, 
pay close attention before you do a 529 plan, but there's a lot of ways to help your kids invest um, that you don't pay taxes now and they don't pay taxes in the future. And if you need those, call Tom Wheelwright from Wealthability and he'll help you out there. Uh, there, there you go. So talk to me a little bit about uh, health savings accounts and flexible spending accounts. And because there's employers that offer those things pre-tax that can also help you out. Oh, they're, they're great. Um, so health savings accounts. I mean, of course, you have to have the right plan and you need to make sure that you can do it. And you actually have to use the money. I mean, that's actually the key is because if you don't use it, you lose it. And so what you're going to do, like on a health savings account, is you're going to say, well, how much money do I spend like on deductibles, on um, on other um, uh, medical expenses that are not covered by my insurance? And then you can actually get a health savings account. The Your employer actually withholds from your wages, puts it into the health savings account. And then when and then you get reimbursed for that health savings account for those expenses and it's not taxable to you. So that's a way to deduct metal, medical expenses because otherwise you've got the seven and a half percent floor, right, of your income. So if you make $100,000, you don't get to deduct the first $7,500 of your medical expenses. But with a health savings account, you get to deduct every dollar to the extent of that health savings account. Flexible spending accounts are similar. So anything you can do, to use pre-tax dollars instead of after-tax dollars for expenses is a good idea. So that's one way to put your money to work for you. You're taking it out pre-tax, you're paying your medical bills with it. Let's say I have investments. Where am I putting my money? Obviously, real estate you talked about. Are there other places to put my money that can help it grow and make my money? Work? You know, I often use the, the phrase, you need your money to work for you is just as hard as you work at your vocation. Absolutely. Are there places to put my money where I can maximize a tax benefit, but also see my money grow? Yeah, I actually, um, in, in the book, The Winning Wealth Strategy, I actually go through seven investments the government will pay you to make. Um, that's the subtitle of the book. And it starts with uh, really the big four. And the big four would be um, business, which we've talked about extensively, real estate, um, which is long-term rental real estate. It's not fix and flips. Okay, that's a business. Um, but rental real estate, the third one would be energy. And the fourth one is agriculture. But there are a couple of others that provide some uh, really interesting tax benefits, particularly for employees who don't want to do those alternative investments. One is life insurance. Uh, life insurance is a way for uh, money to grow tax-free. Um, it's technically tax deferred, but because, you know, eventually you're going to die. If you actually have uh, life insurance, like whole life, um, universal life that grows, that actually grows in what the surrender value is, um, when you die, it's not taxable. So uh, you can actually make that permanent. So that's actually one tax free investment. And another one would be, of course, your IRA, your 401k. So these are things that employees can do. Um, and, and you can max those out. And remember that you actually do pay less tax. I, I used to think you didn't. But I ran the numbers. <laughs> and you actually do pay less tax um, on a on the money you put in. And the reason in a 401k and the reason is, is because uh, your the last dollar you earn is taxed at your highest rate, which means the first dollar you deduct is deducted at your highest rate. So let's say your top marginal rates 32%. Well, that means that $10,000, you get a $3,200 tax benefit. But when you take it out, when you retire, you get all the brackets. So that means you get a 0% bracket, you get a 10% bracket, you get a 12% bracket, you get a 22% bracket. So you're getting these, you're getting the benefit of the brackets um, when you take it out, but you get the benefit of the marginal tax rate when you put it in. So it actually is a benefit, a net benefit um, to be uh, investing through a 401k. Is there a benefit to, you know, we talked about the marriage tax. Is there a yeah. benefit to being married filing separately? Not usually. Um, that's pretty unusual. It, it'd be where like one spouse has a lot of medical expenses, for example. And so, and, and they, they have less income so that you end up because your tax rates stay the same, right? You don't get lower tax rates because you're married finally separately. Um, the government figured that out a long time ago. So um, you don't get that benefit. But what you can get is sometimes you can get more deductions um, if you 
um, because like itemized deductions, tip, a lot of them have thresholds. And if you don't meet that threshold combined, you might meet it separate. And that would be the one time um, that you would really get that uh, when, when it would make a difference. But I will tell you in 45 years, I've probably seen it work three times. Probably not worth it. But, you know, we talked about going to college and I know that a lot of people are college is expensive. I have one in college. I know all about college being expensive <laughs> and you, you you apply for financial aid and it's all about your adjusted gross income and yep. all your expenses. And that's how you also get taxed is on your adjusted gross income to a degree. How do we lower our is are there tax benefits to lowering your adjusted gross income and how ways to do that to try and yep get that financial aid that we could all use? That, that's a very astute question. I, I will say, I haven't had that question for a while. Thank you. Um, we have two different um, numbers on our tax return. We have adjusted gross income and taxable income. And taxable income is simply adjusted gross income minus your standard deduction or your itemized deductions, right? Whichever is higher. Um, but adjusted gross income, that's the the number that's used for a lot of different tests in the tax law. It's what's used to determine your earned income credit, part, uh, partly to determine, determine whether you get an earned income credit. It's used to determine whether you get a the 20% um, qualified business income deduction for a, a business. It's used to determine um, how much your uh, medical expense deduction, we were just talking about that, 7.5%. It's used to, to determine that. Um, during COVID, it was used to determine uh, whether you got the $1,400 check from the government or the $600 check from the government. And so that AGI is, is a big deal. And there are some things you can do. Um, certainly the biggest thing is <laughs> to um, you reduce your AGI with your, you know, putting money into your 401k that reduces your AGI. Um, you reduce it by investing in business, real estate, energy, agriculture, et cetera. And, uh, and, 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 and then there are a few items that are actually, um, you know, we used to get alimony, to reduce our AGI, uh, if you get divorced now, you don't get alimony anymore. Um, it's not taxable to the person who gets it, but you don't get to deduct it. If you uh, got married long back prior to 2018, you still get to deduct your alimony. So there are some things you can do, but that AGI actually, I, I'll give you another example. Um, whether you get to deduct your investment losses because of depreciation from real estate, can be impacted by your AGI. Uh, if your AGI is over $150,000, um, uh, then you don't get to deduct if you're just you know, a, a little bit active in your real estate. Um, you're not a real estate professional, but if it's, it's $100,000 or less, you get to deduct up to $25,000 of those losses. And so it, it does have a very big impact. So that's a very astute question. So I wanted to ask you about estate planning and how to protect yourself in your later years. I, you know, some people obviously pass on earlier, but you want to look, you work hard for your money. You don't want to give it to the government upon your passing. You want to make sure that your kids are taken care of. You talk about estate planning in your book. Talk to us a little bit about how we can go about protecting all of our assets. Well, right, right now the estate, um, uh tax exemption is really high. I mean, it's um, it's uh, like $13 million per person. So if you're married, it's like $26 million. So it's a very high, very few people are subject to a state tax right now um, as a population. Uh, I have a, I have a, I had a friend once who used to call the estate tax, the um, stupid tax he said, cause you only pay it if you're not paying attention. Right. It, it's uh, maybe the inattention tax would be a nicer way to say it, but um, it's really easy to plan for. Here's the thing about estate planning. Um, even if you don't have an estate tax, you need to do estate planning because you want to have a will. If you have small kids, you want to make sure that they have a guardian represented. If um, you, you'd like to avoid probate because you don't want um, when, if, when you die, you don't want um, the, the pirates, what I call the pirates and the predators coming out and going after your family and saying, Hey, I got a deal for you. Right. Because, um, that probate that's so probate is simply the mechanism the court uses to change the title from you to the person who inherited 
the property. So that's what probate is about. And um, it's public. And there are people that make a living going after the, the 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 people who are you know now they're in they're they're tearful they're sad and these people go after them they are predators and so I I don't like probate I know it's not hard and estate plan attorneys will say well it's not a big deal anymore I will say I still think it's a big deal because I think your privacy for your um, loved ones is a big deal. And that's easy enough through a trust. That's a simple living trust. It's very inexpensive. I think most people should have a living trust um, unless you've only got a few assets. But if you've got a house, you probably need a living trust. If you have um, any, uh, in, any significant uh, uh, stock investments outside of your 401k, or your IRA, you probably need a living trust. So those those things are basic estate planning. Um, if when when you're starting making more money and you start accumulating more assets, you get a little older like me, then uh, you do start thinking about how can I do this. I will say one other thing about estate planning, which I I don't ever hear other tax advisors talking about, and that is that how what you do with your money when you die, or what you're going to do with your money when you die, can have a major impact on how much ta income tax you pay now. So we frequently think of estate taxes separate from income tax. They're separate parts of the law and you have estate planning attorneys and you have income tax accountants, right? Typically those are the two parties. Um, but the two together, when you have uh, the estate plan attorney work with the income tax advisor, uh, you can actually have a really good result on your income tax. So don't think that estate tax only affects estate tax. It also affects income tax. So I, my last question is you talked a lot about investing in agriculture or energy. How does one go about doing that? You know, energy is pretty easy. Uh, I, I mean, let's look, look at putting solar panels on your house. I mean, that's an investment in energy. If you, it, it, what's interesting is, so to go back to the business, if you have a rental property and you put solar panels on your rental property, you not only get a tax credit, but you also get a tax deduction. If you put them on your personal residence, you only get the tax credit. So you basically, you double the amount of the tax benefit because you put it on a rental property instead of putting it on your own property, on your personal residence. So again, having a business, um, having that direct investment can have a, a major impact, but there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, you can buy, um, you know, if you're, you're thinking about buying an electric car, you've got that $7,500 deduction. I'll give you a, one little trick there. If your car doesn't otherwise qualify because either your income's too high or for some other reason, um, uh, other than that, it's an electric car, it's still gotta be an electric car. Um, you might consider leasing it because leases actually have better tax laws then um, ownership. Leases have better tax benefits than ownership these days when it comes to uh, that $7,500 tax credit. So you kind of avoid some of those limitations by leasing it. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is you put a charger in your home and you get tax credits for that too. And don't forget um, your local utility probably gives you tax, uh, you know, some savings um, and your, your state may give you tax savings for these as well. So it's not just the federal. Well, there's many, many ways to save money. Tom Wheelwright, thank you so much for joining me. I know that uh, I have learned a ton and I'm going to go change my facts because I obviously want to save money on my tax bill. And I know you have a podcast. Tell us about your podcast. I do. It's the Wealth Ability Show and uh, we, it's uh, every week and it's found wherever you can find podcasts. And we also have a, uh, I also have a YouTube channel for that. And then uh, if you want the, you, you asked about tax advisors, if you want the easy button, the easy button is we actually have a franchise of tax advisors, CPA based franchise. Um, and just go to wealthability.com and we'll find you a, one of our franchisees who actually studies with me. And I know the 15th is coming up. Can we find you on social media where you give out tax tips? Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere these days. So I'm, I, I'm probably obnoxiously everywhere. Oh, you appreciate it. I appreciate your time. And I, I know that uh, a lot of our viewers are going out and putting solar panels on their roofs and investing in agriculture. And uh, they, they're obviously going to go and buy rental properties like I am going to go and do. But uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. The, uh, the insights were invaluable. Thank you. 
If you need help being financially resilient, please head over to Wealthion.com and sign up for a free, no obligation consultation from one of our vetted registered investment advisors. And remember to follow us on social media for the latest news and information to help you invest wisely. Thank you for watching. And until next time, stay informed, stay empowered, and may your investments flourish.